everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me today. I've got a ton of fascinating stuff, including Jack Smith, the special prosecutor who's been brought in to investigate Trump's connection to the January the 6th insurrection and also the removal of the classified documents to Mar-a-Lago. What is the relationship going to be like between Jack Smith and Donald Trump? I took a look at that. Plus, the Supreme Court evidence is surfacing of a potential second leak by Samuel Alito in a case in 2014. I thought I'd look at the Supreme Court over the next 12 months. Will there be ructions and changes there? Plus, Jim Jordan, who's about to chair the House Judiciary Committee, but he's got big problems of his own. And I did wonder what his life would be like in 2023. So I had a look at that. Plus, the Walt Disney Company, which has been through a really rough time over the past couple of years. Its stock has tanked, and it's just fired its CEO. So people were curious about what would happen to Disney in the new year. I took a look at that. And talking of stocks that have tanked, I looked at Tesla as well to see if that's ever going to get back up to normal. Plus a whole bunch more. Now, you probably noticed that I didn't respond to your comments last time. I just didn't have a chance, but I did read every single one of them. And thank you very much for posting them, particularly the really enlightening stuff about tree hugging. I went tree hugging in the previous video. If you didn't see it, I'll put a link to that in the show notes below this one. But I went tree hugging and the tree basically rejected me. Many of you said that's because A, you were embarrassed and giggling, which is true. And also, I was carrying a, a camera, electronic device, and that is going to jam the tree's frequencies. So you're right. I don't know why I didn't see that, but you're just way more enlightened than I am. And so in the next couple of weeks, I'll give it another go and see if I get better results. I'll report back. Now, as you probably realize, this week is Thanksgiving in the US. And I know from painful experience that people don't tend to watch videos over Thanksgiving. They're busy doing other things. So rather than produce, very selfishly, I might say, <laughs> but instead of producing a video for Saturday in the normal way, I'm gonna give you something special. A viewer recommended that I do pictures for a pilot who disappeared about 50 years ago, supposedly abducted by aliens, but of course he was. You know how I feel about alien abductions, but I did the pictures anyway, and they were really fascinating. Almost convinced me that there may be something to this. Just in case, I consulted with my psychic medium friend, Debbie Griggs, and she did this guy too, and the result was ultra fascinating. So that's the video I'm going to post on Saturday. It will be about the guy who was supposedly abducted by aliens. And finally, I have done transition pictures for Anne Frank. If you remember, I did them about a year and a half ago, or tried to. I wasn't allowed in. There was like a firm no and I thought maybe it's because she was 15 and I don't tend to feel comfortable doing pictures for children. But I now discover from having done them this week that I simply wasn't mature enough spiritually or in terms of my understanding of transitions to be able to interpret the pictures correctly. With experience, I now can and I found them mind-blowing. There's a certain aspect to them that really made me sit up and think. So I'll be posting those in the next few days on the Soul Crossings channel. If you're not a subscriber to that, then maybe pop over there and do it. Almost 10,000 people now. I'm so happy. Uh, but the pictures will be up on there um, by early next week, probably, I would think. Uh, okay, so let's get cracking with Jim Jordan, U.S. Representative from Ohio, who from January will be chairing the House Judiciary Committee. But instead of doing anything useful with that post, he will be investigating Hunter Biden and Hunter Biden's laptop, doing nothing good for the country, simply distracting, taking up time, wasting Benghazi-style energy and public money to no particular end. But I thought, well, hang on a minute. Doesn't Jim Jordan have problems of his own? Wasn't he, allegedly, connected with the planning of the January the 6th insurrection? So 
Isn't Merrick Garland looking into him? Didn't the January the 6th committee look into... I don't know. And I thought it's worth looking at his pictures to see if there is trouble ahead for Jim Jordan. Because if you remember the pictures I did for the House last time, the Republicans thought they were fine. There was a screen there, a barrier. But after a while clouds of smoke started pouring through the cracks, chasing the Republicans away. They only had a honeymoon period for a while. And that was echoed in the Jim Jordan pictures, actually, because when I went into his energy, there he is, looking cute as blazers, he was walking through what seemed to be a subterranean tunnel. It was underground and the floor was littered with debris. Now, maybe this is genuine stuff that he uncovers as part of his investigations, or it could relate to him. But he was walking around it, sidestepping these piles of garbage, debris, or whatever they were. There was a doorway, an exit point. A voice seemed to say, come on, Jim, come up here now cooperate, offer information, play your part in justice and democracy. He didn't want to know. Oh, <laughs> don't you know who I am? I'm Jim Jordan, the diminutive Ohio US representative. I don't play those kind of games. I've got power now. He was full of himself. And he went on up the corridor dodging the debris. But as with the screen and the smoke in the house pictures I did last time, there was thick, black, oily smoke filling the corridor ahead. You know when in the Middle East they set tire fires and plumes, horrible plumes of black smoke float into the atmosphere? It was like that. And he thought, <laughs> Jim Jordan, a bit of smoke is not going to bring me down, pal. And he walks right into it. Immediately, it is toxic. It is crippling. <coughs> and he recoils out of it. Oh my God, what am I going to do? This is terrible. He doesn't know what to do. He looks at that opening and goes, if I go up there, maybe I'm just reducing my prison sentence, not avoiding it. Maybe I will keep my job, but I will be shrouded in shame if I do. If this black smoke leaks out of the corridor and goes upstairs. He has some terrible prospects down the road in 23. Right now, he's pretty cocky. He thinks everything's going to be fine. But as he moves ahead around this debris, he could get his comeuppance pretty soon and could poison his chances of advancing in the future. Also related to the previous video to this one, do you remember I did the relationship between Donald Trump and Mike Pence? And the pictures seem to show that there was a trade-off. Mike Pence saying to Donald Trump, look, I will not reveal any of your secrets. I will sit in interviews rigid and I will think for 15 minutes before I answer so that I don't give anything away about what you did. As long as you leave me alone, just go away. I'd never want to see you again. But I thought afterwards, wouldn't it be interesting if I could go into the consciousness of Mike Pence and perceive life the way he perceives it? So I did. I went into this picture from an ABC interview, and yes, there was definitely constriction. I couldn't move. It was like I was in a straitjacket. And my skin, instead of being, you know, malleable and fun, <laughs> was actually like eggshells. It was brittle. It was very, very breakable. I was incredibly sensitive. I couldn't move because if I did, I would shatter my eggshell protection. And when I looked through his eyes and was sort of perceiving things through his consciousness, it was incredibly narrow, rather like being inside a mailbox and peering out. He could only see that over there and this over there. Nothing else. If he looked over there or over there, 
It might expand his consciousness. It might give him a perspective that he had trained himself not to see. He would only see things he needed to see and nothing else because everything else would undermine his tribal script, his belief system. And what's more, he couldn't turn around and look at the broader picture because if he did, his shell-like skin shattered into a thousand tiny pieces. And when that happened, people could see the real vulnerable him. If he ventures beyond what is known into the unknown, the world might see Mike Pence for who he really is. And that's a risk he's not prepared to take. I also took a look at the Walt Disney Company. They have been through hell these past couple of years. What happened was that they had an amazing CEO called Bob Iger. He was responsible for overseeing the acquisition of Star Wars and building up the Marvel Universe and the theme parks expanding and so on. This guy is a genius. But eventually he retired and was replaced by another guy called Bob Chapek. And the difference between the two Bobs is that Bob Iger believes that creative people should be allowed to be creative. And creativity is more important than making money because you make money if you create the right stuff. Bob Chapek thought the other way. He believes that it's money first and the Disney company should make as much money as possible. At some point, he was going to move the company from its roots in California to Florida so that they could get the tax breaks there. But it meant that a bunch of people would have to leave. People who've been there for decades would have to leave. Then he got tangled with the Ron DeSantis don't say gay bill in Florida. And then he also refused to pay Scarlett Johansson the money that she should have had for her movie. It, it, the whole thing went really, really badly. And Bob Chapek has just been fired. <laughs> Basically, just one phone call. You're out. Our lawyers will call your lawyers. Bye. And gone. And Bob Iger, to everybody's shock and surprise, is coming back. He will make Disney a creative powerhouse again, it is hoped. But I thought, let's take a look at what might happen to Disney, whether it can recover from its terrible slump that it's in right now. And when I went into the energy, there is Disney walking along a path, not looking particularly perky, I have to say. But up ahead and in the night sky... A flare went off, you know, like the flares they fire from lifeboats. It was one of those. And it lit up the sky, causing wonder, like oh, the projects we have coming, the movies, the theme park, everything's going to be amazing. This could be a timing issue. We may already be past this, by the way, because this was anticipatory. This was excited, like oh, we got some great product coming down the line. The flare broke into pieces, came down, and when Disney was standing under it, the pieces actually hit Disney's skin. It was like, ah, 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 it's phosphorus. It burns them. These projects, these hopes, they come crashing down and they fail. And that's actually what has happened with Disney. So many of their best hopes have failed. There was a lot of work to be done to unpick the stitches of the corporate cardigan that Bob Chapek had been knitting. But it did move away this storm. Disney, having been burned, walks ahead into a broad open plain where it has been raining very, very heavily. But the clouds are now starting to roll away, allowing rays of sunshine through which does two things. Firstly, it illuminates the landscape and shows all the puddles and holes there are in it that need repairing. But secondly, it starts drying out that landscape. Now things can improve. Sogginess can go away. The terrain can become firm and sunny. Things are going to improve. But it may take a year. We may be talking the whole of 23 here for this to happen. Then there was a hill. Usually that relates to adjustments. You have to do certain things now to get back on track. And the path ahead was raised up. So that involves a challenge of climbing up to that. But once it was on that path, 
it was heading in the exact direction it needed to. Things were going to get better for Disney eventually. Maybe not until 2024, but they were. As long as Bob Iger's genius was able to rescue it from the dumps. So eventually the stock price will probably go back up again. Speaking of which, I took a look at Tesla as well. Their stock price is now down to 168. I think it was the last time I looked. That is also disastrous. Part of it's because they've had trouble with the cars. Uh, they set on fire or the self-driving ones kind of just go into the crowd and hit people, apparently. Then there's Elon Musk, who, because of his MAGA antics on Twitter, has shown to the world that he's not that much of a genius after all. He's really quite insecure and a narcissist. And it's meant that he has tarred Tesla's name. People are now looking at a Tesla saying, well, that's a $40,000 MAGA hat you're driving. So I thought, because the stock price is tanking here too, I would go and have a look and see if there was a chance that it might go up in the future. Now, you know not to trust my stock pictures, right? Because I don't know if they're right or wrong. They could so easily be horrible. So let's step aboard the tip -tanic. <laughs> where we watch our savings sink without trace. <laughs> but uh, I went into the energy of Tesla's stock price at $168. There it is. It's been sliding for a while. And when I did, it was walking in shadow. It was behind this hill. Never a good place to be. I wasn't absolutely sure whether it went up a little bit, down a little bit, or it was straight, but it was in shadow. Something needed to be done about the stock price. There is then a change of direction. Maybe they fire Elon Musk, but something needs to be done because the path that Tesla needs to be on is on the other side of the hill. That's the way forward, not the path they're on. Something radical has to change. Once they did get onto that path, which may take a while, there was a path upwards, a climb, a hill, a challenge, not easy. And when it got to the top, the surface was level like a plateau and white and fine, but slippery. One false move and you slide right off the edge. I think it remains precarious, even when it seems to be getting better. But if you remember the stock market pictures I did fairly recently, it showed that the market would go down again, which is exactly what's happening right now. But at some point, a company would start to find its feet and the stock price would start to rise. And then another one, and then another one, then another one. That could apply to Disney. That could apply to Tesla. They just need to find this new level of development, of branding, of prosperity, whatever it is, so that they can start to sow seeds of growth again and establish a firmer footing. I also took a look at the problems being faced by the US Supreme Court. Do you remember? I did their pictures quite a while ago now, and the justices were standing on a very, very large shelf, and things were going well. It was okay. Uh, the shelf gave way and threw them off, prompting a reorganization and panic and all kinds of problems. It seemed improbable when I did the pictures, and then everything caved in. Well, they really lost the trust of the American people because there's been so many problems like with Kavanaugh being appointed and uh, Coney Barrett being appointed and Justice Thomas and Ginny and Samuel Alito, whose opinion about the Roe v. Wade case was leaked ahead of time. Well, now, because of reporting in, I think, the New York Times, it looks like there's another problem with Samuel Alito's decision in 2014 involving the Hobby Lobby case. This was about contraception which was allowed under the Affordable Care Act and Hobby Lobby being an evangelically disposed company went, no, we're not giving out contraceptives. Are you crazy? And so it went to court and at some kind of conservative fundraiser, 
Alito, Judge Alito, went, oh, you know, we got this decision coming up. And one of the wealthy donors goes, oh, really? And immediately places a call to some evangelical group and says, allegedly, something like, oh, my gosh, you never believe what I've just found out from Justice Alito. That's what the problem is. It was leaked ahead of time. And I thought maybe this is a good moment to look at the Supreme Court over the next year and see what might happen. And when I did, there was, it wasn't a picture, it was like a diorama with a frame. And the justices were standing on steps inside the diorama. And that was it. They were just standing there. But then I noticed the weirdest thing happened. Because from the feet of some of them came dribbles of, seemed like paint. It was different colours. And it ran down the steps, over the frame, and then dribbled down the wall. Now, it mainly came from three of them. Obviously not sure which, but three of them. The fourth one, not so much, but there were definitely three. The main ones that were the problem started to melt and cave in on themselves and flow out of the diorama. They went down the steps, over the frame, and down. The people who were left behind, the justices, were going, oh my God, this is terrible. There was gossip, there was frustration, there was consternation. They stood around thinking, what are we going to do? The other justices had gone down the wall. And as I followed them through, they flowed along the floor and then into some kind of waste duct and away. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll be impeached or be forced to resign. This all could be behind closed doors. Some kind of meltdown that happens within the nine justices themselves. Like, oh my God, we have got to do something. This is not working out. We have completely lost the trust of the American people. But it was drastic. And it did seem like something had gone horribly wrong inside the Supreme Court. And it was rotten on the inside and had been melted by some force, exposure, publicity, from the outside that had worked like a heat lamp and forced the resistance, the exterior, the presentation, to melt away. And uh, as a result, caused some kind of internal chaos in the Supreme Court. And finally, I took a look at Jack Smith. <laughs> you would not want that guy investigating you at all. But he is investigating Donald Trump, who should be very, very scared. Jack Smith is a war crimes prosecutor based in the Netherlands. And he's based in the Netherlands still because he fell off his motorbike or something and damaged his leg and he can't walk. So he's organizing everything from Europe. Trump, in the previous pictures, was running behind pillars, avoiding investigation, and he will still continue to do that. But in these pictures, Jack Smith rolled up his sleeves. There they are, side by side. His sleeves were up and he was going, right, let's get down to business. And he went and slumped in a chair with his hands in his pockets, like... Okay, Donald Trump, what are we going to do about you? And what he did was he got a length of wire and began making strips of it and stretching it across a little gully, like trip wire, actually. He did a number of these all the way down. Donald Trump was flummoxed by this. What is this guy doing? It was mystifying. He was speechless. Which, for people who don't like my Trump impression, is probably a godsend. <laughs> but Jack Smith was really, really busy putting things in order, cataloging everything, arranging his approach, his arguments, his evidence. When he was done, he said... Uh, okay, Mr. Trump, if you'd like to come towards me, please. Donald Trump 
said, I'm not going down here. I will trip up their trip wires. I'm not doing it. In the end, Jack Smith was so determined that Trump knew he had to walk down this gully, but very, very carefully. And he got so far, delays, arguments, putting his lawyers in the way as cannon fodder. But in the end, he caught his foot in one of the wires and went down. <laughs> Landed flat on his back on these wires. They were like cheese wires. I could feel them biting into my flesh. Really sharp. No counter arguments here. You have been nailed. And once he was on his back and couldn't move, Jack Smith went, you're welcome, and walked off. Jack Smith is like a prosecutorial Columbo. He will get his man if he can. And he is dogged about it. Look at his picture. Would you want that guy trying to put you in jail? <laughs> oh my God, it's scary. And uh, he is determined. And I think he has the goods. And the interesting thing about it, though, is that it wasn't so much about him going, I'm going to nail you, Trump. It was more about laying everything out so that Trump could show himself to be guilty. Demonstrate by his efforts to show he's not guilty that he actually was. By his speech, by his deeds, by his truths on Truth Social. It's all combined to make Donald Trump his own worst enemy in these legal cases. And it's not so much that Jack Smith pins him down and goes, yay, we got you. It's more about Trump falling down, tripping over the evidence and nailing himself, really. That's what it felt like. Alrighty, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to subscribe, that would be terrific. And like and share. If you do that, Olive will love you forever. Well, you know, she's asleep right now, but when she wakes up, she'll love you forever. But uh, please don't rely on it. She's very, very fickle. <laughs> don't forget Saturday, the UFO video. I think you'll find, assuming I get it done in time, um, I think you'll find that very, very interesting. Even I, who doesn't buy into the whole ETs and UFOs thing, found it quite tantalizingly uh, insightful. Uh, thanks to Debbie Griggs. All right, so uh, otherwise I will see you hopefully next Wednesday. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.